So why are we seeing temperatures that are seemingly hotter by the year? Is this so-called urban heat island effect real? Here to talk about the theory is Matei Georgescu, a professor at Arizona State University, and thanks for joining us. Break it down for us. Is this thing real? Thank you very much, Mike, for having me on. Yes, absolutely. It's 100% uh, real. We have the uh, observations to prove that it's real, and we have the uh, complex mathematical modeling uh, experiments that substantiate the actual physics that's going on. Uh, in a nutshell, what happens is urban areas uh, are heat sinks. So they absorb incoming solar ra radiation differently than the natural landscape would. So if you have the built environment composed of parking lots, uh, buildings, uh, uh, rows of houses, so on and so forth, the incoming solar radiation is absorbed, it's trapped within the built environment, and then in the evening and nighttime, it is not released as efficiently as it would be had the uh, megapolitan area not actually been present. And that is really the urban heat island effect. Greater uh, near surface temperatures over a city or megapolitan area compared to the uh, natural adjacent undeveloped landscape. Matei, I, uh, I traveled through Phoenix years ago where it's not as developed as it is now. Um, the temperatures there were always high. I know it's about 100 degrees there today. What does this contribute to a place like that which is already hot to begin with? So a direct consequence of the rapid uh, buildup of the Phoenix metropolitan area and the Sun Corridor, which is centered upon Phoenix, is that nighttime temperatures do not decrease to levels that they would have. For example, uh, if you go back 30, 40 years ago, nighttime minimum temperatures would readily be in the 80s and uh, in the 70s and 80s degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Now it is becoming increasingly common for temperatures to not go below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, that's a problem. It's a problem for humans, it's a problem for uh, uh, animals, it's a problem from uh, an air conditioning perspective. More energy is required to keep our environments cooler. Matei, uh, I know we're talking about your specific city, but there's a lot of uh, major cities around the world with uh, large construction, high rises. Can you think of other cities that uh, would also fall in the column with Bangkok as, as being uh, severely inhibited by this? Well, any city, so what I should say is that the urban heat island uh, scales according to or has a magnitude uh, that depends on the size of, of its city. Uh, the more uh, horizontally spread out a city is, you can think about, uh, for example, the New York City metropolitan area, but also the more vertical that a city is. Again, I go back to New York City metropolitan area. The more of an urban heat island effect that there is, the less that the... Uh, normal radiation that is absorbed during the daytime is prohibited from uh, escaping out to space. So basically, uh, a, a lot of these cities do fall under this category. We've got about 30 seconds left, but I've got to ask you, is there something that local planners uh, or local governments can do to try and bring this down? So there's a combination of factors. It's important to note that there are no silver bullets. Uh, but the combination of factors include what are known as cool roofs. It's the equivalent in a practical sense of painting your roof white. Uh, increasing vegetation, uh, vegetation cover, that's very important for semi-arid uh, cities like uh, Phoenix and other arid cities. Uh, permeable surfaces such that the water, when it actually falls from rainfall, is able to evapotranspire back into the uh, overlying atmosphere. There's a combination of all these things, including cool roofs, which is something that Chicago has been doing for several years. All right, Matei uh, Georgescu, thank you so much for joining us from Phoenix, Arizona, where it's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit today.